Hey guys, Jonathan and Tim, we're down here again in the Wall Builders Library. We hope that you're having a great day, hope that you're washing your hands, staying safe and learning a lot. But we wanted to pick up where we left off yesterday, talking about some of the founding fathers, some of the yeah. diners, uh, diners of the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> or signers, right? They, I mean, they ate, they Sorry. didn't dine in the revolution. It's, uh, it's 12 o'clock and they I'm hungry. They also signed the document, <laughs> so it's, I mean, yeah. we knew what we meant, it's fine. Signers. Total professionals. Of the Declaration. Signers of the Declaration. We're here to talk to you about a couple more of them. Some of my favorites. Uh, I think we'll start right here, actually, with John Hancock. And if we come around here, we've got some <laughs> interesting some things. Uh, <laughs> bad in a thousand. Uh, we've got some things about John Hancock. What's really interesting, and it's something I think I've never seen really mentioned in any history book, except for the history book that we're about to put out. Uh, shameless plug, but what we've got in here are actually a couple of election sermons. Now these sermons, if you look, right, it's by Zabadal Adams, this one right here, and in fact this other one too, but if you look, it says, A sermon preached before His Excellency John Hancock, Esquire, Governor, and then the Lieutenant Governor as well. And so this is comes from a tradition that's prominent in New England where pastors would come in after a new uh, election, all the new people coming in, the representatives from all the different parts of the state, they would have a pastor come into the halls of the legislature, and the pastor would actually tell them, what does the Bible say about being a good elective yeah. official? What does it say about honesty, about integrity? And there are hundreds mm. of these election sermons, a lot of them from yeah. Massachusetts, all throughout the years. We have a number of them on wallbuilders.com where you can go look, read through it, look at the way yeah. that the pastors applied biblical principles to government, right? Yeah, so for all elected <laughs> officials, right, this was a very common practice. So they knew the expectation, not only from Scripture, but that the people wanted them to be biblical, to be scriptural, yep. and how they legislated. Now, John Hancock was the first governor of Massachusetts. He also was the president of Congress during uh, the signing of the Declaration. Right, we and talked so, about him yesterday. He's the one sitting down while Charles Thompson is standing next to him translating the Bible or right. something. Right, so, so after we separated from Great Britain, then all these colonies now become their own states. They have to go back and write state constitutions, uh, which John Hancock does help Massachusetts, and they did there uh, several years down the road. But as the, the leader of Congress during this time, he is, is one of the... Kind of outspoken yeah. voices. One of the most prominent guys, and even in the years leading up to the revolution, right, he's a prominent merchant in Boston, and Boston is, you know, basically the merchant capital of America, especially up in the north. So he has actually a lot of reasons not to be a patriot because... It England, could cost him everything. Right. England is their trading partner, uh, but he says... I'm willing to let it all go in order for America yeah. to be free. It takes a really strong stand pretty early on for freedom and obviously, right as Tim mentioned, helped lead them through signing the Declaration. So in, in signing the Declaration, John Hancock, his signature is the biggest, right? And it was reported <laughs> that the reason he wrote really big was to make sure that, that King George or right, that old King Bull would be able to read his signature without putting on his spectacles. So that, that's kind of the legend and, and the story behind why his signature was so big. But as governor of Massachusetts, also, he was very outspoken in what he did in regards to faith. And I point that yeah. out because we, we mentioned yesterday that certainly faith is kind of overlooking a lot of the founding fathers, a lot of the signers of the Declaration. And for John Hancock, the thing that's known about him most is his large signature there on the Declaration, <laughs> not really much of his yeah. faith. But as governor, he had 22 different prayer proclamations that he did as governor. We own several of those here at Wall Builders. This one is for prayer and thanksgiving, and, and, and we'll highlight what that was yeah. for in just a second. I'm going to start with this prayer and fasting proclamation first, though. And the reason this is important, you see it says fasting, humiliation, and prayer on it. But what was significant is he called the state to pray, asking for God to help and intervene. But let me just come down here and, and look at what he says together. He's calling upon ministers and people of every denomination to assemble on that day in their respective congregations that with true contrition of heart, we may confess our sins, resolve to forsake them, and implore the divine forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. Notice, right, all capitalized, bold, Jesus Christ, our Savior. John Hancock, not only saying we need to pray to God, he's saying we need to pray that people that don't yeah. know Jesus would come to know Jesus Christ, our Savior. I've never really heard people talk about the faith of John Hancock. Yep. Actually, but, I've seen some some books and doing reading for, for school and class and stuff that actually say Hancock probably wasn't a Christian, and that he was a deist. People have actually taken the other stance on it, but it's like, okay, 
Right. When, right. <laughs> when, when, you, when you study what he did, it's a lot different. And so yep. this, come so back to this Thanksgiving proclamation. This one is awesome. This one is actually during the middle of the Revolutionary War, right? It's a proclamation for a day of Thanksgiving. But if we hop down here, this first paragraph where he's talking about why they're doing this, and we'll pick up at the beginning. He says, Whereas it hath pleased Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, amidst the vicissitudes and calamities of war, to bestow blessings on the people of these states, which call for their devout and thankful acknowledgments, more especially in the late remarkable interposition of his, that's God's, of his watchful providence in rescuing the person of our commander and chief and the army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. Now, just think about it, right? Middle of the Revolutionary War, treason, commander-in-chief, that's George Washington, the army. And this proclamation came out November 1780. Yeah. Okay, so back up just a couple of months, and there was a pretty treacherous plot that was exposed. What is he, uh, isn't it like a, a breakfast item now? I don't eat breakfast, so I, I don't know. <laughs> it's Benedict Arnold, right? Oh, like yeah, it's yeah. Benedict? Okay. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. I don't eat breakfast either. I don't I, know why I thought I could connect that <laughs> metaphor. Um. I apologize. He's... Oh, we're, we're going to get better. Okay, just hang with us. So, John Hancock not only does prayer and fasting proclamations, it's prayer and thanksgiving proclamations, and very specific situations we're thanking God for, because I've even seen professors say, well, they might have done prayer proclamations. But it was all formal. They, they were just generalized proclamations. They didn't really they, mean it. They weren't really religious. No, there was very specific things. John Hancock said, this moment right here, we need to thank God for what he just did in this moment. Now, John Hancock was the first governor of Massachusetts. He's not the only guy who signed the declaration who also was a yeah. governor. Oh, and, and before we go with John Hancock, we actually have a number of uh, these proclamations, these broadsides. We have four different ones on the website. So if you want to get uh, a facsimile copy of it, we've got them on the website. They're pretty cool. Check it out. You can read all about it in the yeah, rest so you can of go them. Through, you can go through. There's two that are, are prayer and, and fasting proclamations. Then there's two that are prayer and thanksgiving proclamations. That's the one with George Washington. Yeah, the one we just read. And so you you can read these on the website. But again, if you want to have one of these, if you're a teacher in your classroom, now that we're all homeschooled, <laughs> hang them at home, right? They're or have cool. them for, for people to see. And, and one of the things we do in the summer is we bring in college students. We do kind of an intern program. We call it a training program. And Leadership we, training program. Yeah, we, we let people actually hold and read and go through some of these documents. And the reason is, once you've seen and held the original, when you hear somebody say, well, the founding fathers didn't believe in God, they weren't religious, blah, blah, blah. You're like, no, no, no. I actually held these original proclamations. And in this situation, right, these aren't the original proclamations, but they are copies of can, the original. <laughs> if so you're that, in college, you could take it to class with you whenever you go back. Yeah, That'd be so fun. that when, when somebody says that never happened, actually, here's a reprint of what they did. So we, we do try to make some of that history available so you can see some of what's there. Yeah. Now, the next guy, one of the, I would argue, one of the more famous guys, he sits right here in the picture in the room. Chilling. His name is Sam Adams. And we do Oh, have, I know Sam Adams. <laughs> yeah, so, so what, what, what do you know about Sam Adams, right? What's the most famous thing about Sam Think Adams? About it. Uh, Think about it. Oh, he's the beer guy. Beer. Which is, is really sad for Sam Adams. Like, that's his yeah. legacy that people know today. Because and I think the guy who started that company actually just really liked Sam Adams, and that's why he called it. So he meant it as a good thing, but now that's the only thing people know about him. <laughs> right, so, so like the Adams family, they did have a brewery. So Sam Adams, uh, his father had a brewery, except Benjamin Rush, we, we talked about him before. Benjamin Rush actually did a study of all the alcohol content at the, the time. He measured the proof of the alcohol. And he pointed out that for the Adams brew, it was like a malt liquor. It wasn't enough to really get you drunk. There was enough alcohol in it to kill, like the bacteria yeah. in it. But it was like drinking root beer, right, essentially. You're like, yeah, drink root beer. You drink beer? No, no, root beer. Like, no <laughs> alcohol. You couldn't get drunk off the Adams brew. And actually, when Adam, Sam Adams' father died, he left it to Sam Adams. Sam Adams was described as a terrible businessman <laughs> because every business venture he ever had failed. Just completely tanked. I mean, almost. In, I think he got fired from just about every so, single job yeah, he ever had. My favorite, my favorite story of him getting fired from a job, he was a tax collector. And he got fired from being a tax collector because so when awesome. he would go home to home, he would go, wait a second, you shouldn't have to pay that much. You keep some of this money. So he started returning people's taxes, wouldn't charge them for it. Man, and would, so, it, would that we would have Sam Adams today. Right? right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. 
just I, stop taking so much of my money, government. This is ridiculous. So Sam Adams got fired. He was never successful in any business venture, but he was known as an incredible patriot. One of the yeah. leaders of the Sons of Liberty, which actually a really cool part of Sons of Liberty. One of the things they did, we have right here a book. It's uh, by a guy by the name of John Wise. And I think we might have mentioned him last uh, earlier this he week. He was a pastor. Right, pastor. <laughs> had a lot of the... the uh, ideas that made its way into the Declaration of Independence, but this is actually a collection of his sermons. Uh, it's called A Vindication of the Government of New England Churches by John Wise, and if we look at the year, it's actually 1772 when this is published. That's in the Roman numerals, but what's really interesting is who published this and who sent it out. It was actually the Sons of Liberty who paid for its publication so that people could take these, read these, learn the principles that in just four years mm. later would yeah. materialize into what we see in that photo, right? The signing of the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, so, so how did how do wisest phrases from his sermons appear in the Declaration? Because the Sons of Liberty wanted to make sure that every patriot throughout Massachusetts, right, the Boston area, and then this spread beyond that too, but they wanted to make sure they knew what the Bible said. In fact, Sam Adams, in 1772, when he's writing a Communities of Correspondence, part of the, what Sons of Liberty was doing, one of the things he says, right here it says, the rights of the colonists as Christians. These may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and the head of the Christian church, which are to be found closely written and promulgated in the New Testament. So if you want to understand the rights of the colonists as Christians, study the Bible and specifically, right, the head, who is Jesus, study the New Testament so this is Sam Adams, right, helping lead the Sons of Liberty, and he's explaining, if you want to understand the way we view our rights as colonists, as Christians, mm-hmm. study the Bible, which then makes sense that they would print sermons from a pastor who's explaining what the Bible says about this. Now, he was the second governor after John Hancock, yep. and as governor, he also had a prayer proclamation, and actually several prayer proclamations. And just pull this out right here so we can take a look at it. Yeah, this is one of his prayer proclamations as governor. So this is one of the original proclamations. Uh, he had several as governor. He then got sick in office, had to resign. And so he was only governor for roughly three and a half years. In three and a half years, he had seven prayer proclamations, which is not bad. We also have some sermons that were preached before him while he was governor, just like before John Hancock, where they would bring in a pastor to come deliver sermons. Uh, Sam Adams had the same scenario. So a, a very notable founding father. It was reported when the British came to America that there were two people specifically. Yep. They wanted to target. You find their bodies. You bring bring them back. And so finding their bodies, that could seem to indicate like dead or alive. Just find these guys, kill them, whatever, bring them back alive, just get them. And it was John Hancock and Sam Adams. And the reason was they were two of the more outspoken voices, the more recognized leaders in what was going on. And it was believed that if if you could silence the leaders, maybe you can end this rebellion against the king. And so that was kind of the thought with Sam Adams and John Hancock. Sam Adams has been called the father of the American Revolution because He was such a leader in stirring this up. One of the interesting things about him, too, is a a lot of times today we hear that the Founding Fathers were largely (laughs) rich, rich, white guys. I mean, white, (laughs) largely, yes, that's that's largely true, okay. But the idea that they all were these these wealthy landowners, plantation owners, totally fabricated, not at all true. Study the life of Sam Adams, just as an example. (laughs) Failed in business. Fired from being a tax collector. Basically, and then yeah, whenever, every job, right? They ask him and send him off. And, and but so so it's, it's worth noting the reason he was a failed business person is because he neglected to operate the businesses he was in charge of because yeah. he was more interested in going and trying to stir the patriots in the midst of this revolution. What good is business if we don't have our liberty? And so that's why every business failed. He didn't really spend the time he should. And so people recognize he's a terrible businessman, but an amazing patriot. So when the time came for leaders to be chosen from states to go to Continental Congress, the leaders or the people from his area said, this is the best leader we have, the best speaker, the best communicator we have. Yeah, we've got to send him. Sam Adams has to go. But Sam, there's have something you with your clothes. seen the way he dresses? Like, <laughs> this guy, oh my, he's so bad. Holes. He only, yeah, he only had one suit, which was old and torn and kind of really shabby. He had one pair of stockings, holes in them, and they and said... that's like the socks they used to wear, <laughs> if you look at it. Right. Know. That's why they wore pants. Yeah. But people looked and said, okay, uh, we'd be embarrassed for people to see him and think that's what we look like. <laughs> so they took up a collection. The townspeople donated money to buy him a new suit. Then they bought him several pairs of stockings. And then they said, okay... But how do we get him there? Because he doesn't have a horse, he doesn't have a carriage. Yeah, and if he walks there, he'll show up in the same shabby condition <laughs> right. as we just He'll have fixed. worn holes in the stockings, yeah. he'll be dusty and dirty. So 
somebody wrote a letter to his cousin John Adams and said, hey, can we borrow a horse for your cousin? We want him to go, but he doesn't have a horse and ours are busy at our farms. So like literally this dude is super poor. People are raising a collection to send him in a suit, get borrowing a horse for him. Well, this again, alone, we hear these ideas of generalizations. They all were wealthy plantation or rich white guys. Some of them were wealthy, that's mm-hmm. true, but not all of them were. And it's also worth pointing out that even the guys that were wealthy... By the end of it, they weren't because they had given all their yeah, money to the cause of the revolution. Almost all of them had given their money away to help the revolution actually be Houses a thing. Houses burned down, chased around the country. I mean, some of them were even imprisoned by the British. Just, again, go back to that book we mentioned yesterday, The Lives of the Signers. Read that. It goes through a lot of their stories telling about how much they actually sacrificed in order to achieve our independence and our liberty. And John John Adams has a great quote saying that, you know, if you don't forget, like if, if posterity forgets the things that make America what it is, free and independent. If you don't make the most of what we've given Yeah, yeah. You, I regret all the stuff that we sacrificed because they sacrificed so much so yeah. consistently. Yeah. Sam Adams is one of those really great guys. So the last guy we'll point to today is a guy named James Wilson. And so we do have a display of James Wilson over in the display case. And James Wilson is a guy, he's this one right here. Uh, in, in a lot of pictures, you'll see him wearing glasses, but this is James Wilson right here. And so James Wilson signed both the Declaration and yeah. the Constitution. And if you notice the way that he's dressed there, he kind of looks like a judge because he was a great legal mind during that period, and he was one of the judges Yeah, he ended up, ended up becoming a U.S. Supreme Court judge appointed by George Washington. So in the display case, uh, we have some things from him. One of them is one of his law books. And so the law book is here when when people wanted to be lawyers in America, you generally studied under a lawyer, you would take your bar exam, and then you would start studying and practicing law. Well, he thought, well, there needs to be a better way than just having to study under one specific lawyer. So let's do some more organized formal training. He helped start the first formal kind of law training in America. His lectures became the law books that were used. And, and one of the things, the, the reason it's open to this page, he's talking about religion and the law. He says, far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends, and mutual assistants. Indeed, these two sciences run into each other. The divine law, as discovered by reason and moral sense, form an essential part of both. So the idea today that, wait a second, in, in civics, and in law, you can't have religion. He says, no, 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 the law is really built on religion, which we know this to be true from so many other early guys who had the same thoughts and ideas. Well, James Wilson, a couple things that we have from him are some of his original law books. I mentioned it was his law lectures that they, they really turned those lectures into books, and those books became kind of the early standard law books. He covered a lot of really interesting things yep. in those law books. A lot of things, a lot of things that you would think, oh, those are just modern issues. Yeah. Things that I certainly wouldn't have applied things, back to the founding yeah, fathers. Things that we deal with today, and you think, well, that's a new issue. For example, 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court had the decision Roe versus Wade, where abortion was legalized in America, and abortion's really grown a lot since then in the industry and what's happened. Still, and probably one of the most hotly debated subjects absolutely. in America right now. And, and and a lot of people think, well, this is really kind of a newer modern issue, not realizing that no, actually. Abortion has been around a long time as an industry, as a practice. Now, technology obviously has changed, but but the principle behind the value of life, the value of the unborn, yep. and what you do with it, because in, in earlier generations, they knew that there were certain potions that you could drink, and it would actually cause you to have a miscarriage. And so if you didn't want to carry the baby to term, you could do this, or, or you would give somebody a potion. They, they knew there were certain things you could do. And so in early America, as he's covering law in America, one of the things from the Declaration they talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yep. And, and so the idea of what does life really mean and who right does it really life. apply to, yeah. right? the idea of a right to life, does that deal with, with unborn children? He covered that in his yep. law books. And so we've actually got it right here. And he says, with consistency, beautiful and undeviating, human life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. In the contemplation of law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb. By law, life is protected, not only from immediate destruction, but from every degree of actual violence, and in some cases, from every degree of danger. 
So right, he is taking a very strong position, and it's, it's interesting that he says, right, life begins when you can feel it stirring in the womb. That's just because their technology hadn't advanced to be able to tell that there is life before that. Yeah, but he there, says, there's no magic stick that you pee on that gives you like a positive or a negative, right, or a line or two lines. Like, no, there's not a magic stick. So when you know you're pregnant, largely not till the infant's stirring in the womb, because before that, right, maybe you had bad food, you're just sick from something, but now... Nope, if it's stirring in the womb, now we realize, oh, there's a child there. Yeah, the legal principle there is as soon as you know that there is life, that life is protected. Yeah, so James Inside, outside, from every degree of danger. So a really strong position from the founders on the issue of life. So James Wilson goes from signing the Declaration. He's one of six guys that signed the Constitution. He then becomes that a U.S. Supreme Court. also signed the Declaration. <laughs> right. Yeah, that good clarifying. Yes. Yeah, so there, there were actually many more, 39 guys on the Constitution. But he's one of only six guys that signed both the Declaration and the Constitution. And then he's made a U.S. Supreme Court justice by George Washington. So very influential as far as the different things he did along his life and journey. But this, again, is why when we look at the Founding Fathers, if we look, for example, right, we talked about this depiction of the famous painting. Today, most people don't know very many of the people, very many of the names, and certainly not many of their stories. And as we learn their stories about their faith, their family, their accomplishments, their education, right, there's a lot more that should shape even some of our discussions and debates yeah. today. Because history really can give us good indications of good policy, bad policy, Absolutely. good decisions, bad decisions. Yeah. It's just today we know so few of their stories. Yep. So join us again uh, tomorrow. And if you haven't finished watching uh, the videos previously, you can go to our Facebook, look at all of the ones from last week, this week, get caught up while you have time in quarantine. But as uh, we're going along, remember we are praying for you guys, asking God's protection in your lives, that y'all are staying healthy, that y'all are staying active, that you're, you know, not losing your mind or fighting with your family while you're, (laughs) you know, being uh, stuck in there in quarantine. But we're praying for you guys, hoping y'all are being blessed by these videos and learning a lot. So we will see you guys again tomorrow.